or not? No, it won't be. I'll just start the webinar. Just started. Hi guys, um, welcome. Um, this is the first of many um, Smart Recovery webinars um, about research. Um, welcome today. Um, I'm the National Program Manager for Smart Recovery. Um, I'm meeting today with um, Associate Professor Pete Kelly and Ali Beck, who I'll introduce to you in just a minute. Um, it's really fantastic that you could join us today. Um, I'm currently meeting, and so is Ali, um, on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, Pete's joining us from the lands of the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal Nation. Um, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging, um, and to any Aboriginal people who might be joining us today for the webinar. Um, I'd like to recognise the moral and legal implications of invasion and dispossession um, and the ways in which they remain unresolved. But um, we'd like to recognise, first of all, the strength and resilience and tenacity of the first owners of our land and how extraordinarily lucky we are to be able to meet on these beautiful lands. Um, just in terms of housekeeping today, um, there'll be loads of opportunities for you guys to um, ask questions, so please feel free to post them. We really, really look forward to those and they'll help us have a really good um, engaged discussion today. Um, I'd like to introduce the team to you now. Um, Associate Professor Pete Kelly is based in the School of Psychology at the University of Wollongong. Um, Pete's a registered psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and has been awarded membership of the Australian Psychological Society, College of Clinical Psychologists. Um, Pete has extensive clinical and research experience working with individuals diagnosed with severe mental illness and substance use problems. Um, Pete's research is focused on the development, implementation and evaluation of evidence-led approaches within the mental health problem substance use treatment setting. Um, Pete holds a number of research grants and consul um, consultancies supporting this work. His program of research is particularly focused on developing and trialling multiple health um, behaviour change interventions for populations who are at risk. Um, Pete's published over 50 peer-reviewed journals and book chapters, um, and he's previously and recently been a recipient of the Excellent in Research Award at the National Drug and Alcohol Awards. In fact, the last time he won that was just last week <laughs> at the NADA Award, so we'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. And Pete was also formerly the youngest CEO of Kadesh Rehab Services. So welcome, Pete. Lovely to have you. <laughs> Thanks, Ange. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and Dr. Alison Beck is a researcher and um, practicing clinical psychologist. Ali's been working with multidisciplinary research and clinical teams to deliver and evaluate um, psychological interventions for addictive behaviours and or mental health concerns since about 2005. Um, Ali's current role is as trial coordinator at the University of Wollongong, where she's working with us at SMART um, and a team of kind of expert clinicians and researchers to develop a ROM, a routine outcome monitoring tool that will help smart recovery group members track their progress over time and provide them with feedback um, on a weekly basis. So that's pretty exciting research. Um, and I'd also like to, I guess, welcome Ali and also the rest of the team. Um, we work with a research advisory committee that is um, on which Pete and Ali sit, but there's also a bunch of other wonderful people that are kind of responsible for all of the research that they'll be talking about today. Um, we might be able to show you a picture of those people, I think. Michael, do you have maybe a picture of everybody? I don't know. But anyway, we've yeah. got... Um, Technology fail, I think, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we've got um, Professor Amanda Baker on the Research Advisory Committee, Professor Fa Frank Dean, um, Professor Anthony Shankshaft, um, Dr Victoria Manning from Victoria, um, Leanne Hydes from Queensland, um, Pete, um, John Kelly from the US and our newest edition is Ali Beck. So welcome guys, really, really lovely to have you here today. Um, is it okay if I kick off with asking you guys some questions or do you want to say hello first or what would you like to do? Oh, you, why don't you say hello first? That's okay. All right, so um, on behalf of everybody, welcome guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. Um, please kick in with your questions because we really, really want to hear them. Um, and I'll just begin by asking these guys some questions about um, their kind of experience in working with us at SMART and the range of kind of research that they've already put together um, to, to describe the kind of work that we're interested in doing. So um, Pete and Ali, my first question is really just about why SMART and why did you become interested in working with SMART? Yeah, uh, 
so I, so I was approached by um, Josette Freeman. So I think anyone that's sort of involved with smart recovery in Australia is, is probably aware of, of Josette. Um, I was approached by Josette at, at a conference a number of a number of years ago now, and um, she eventually sort of came down and, and we met at the University of Wollongong. And um, I think smart recovery, the ethos and the way that it was developed, and if you look at sort of some of the early research articles on smart recovery, it was really around wanting to reflect evidence-based practice and just delivering the, the best sort of possible mutual support group that was, was based on evidence. And so I think from the, from the outset, Smart Recovery was really committed to sort of research and, and evaluation. Um, but up until that stage, there'd been really limited studies um, completed of, of Smart Recovery inter internationally, and we hadn't done anything in, in Australia. And so I think Josette was sort of reaching out, trying to get some, some traction here in Australia and you know, developing a bit of a, a research program around smart recovery. Um, I, I think I've just stuck around because I like you guys. I, I like working with the, the smart recovery team. Um, I think people are in it for the right reasons. Um, it's obviously uh, a, a hugely valuable um, program and, and reaches lots of people you know, across Australia, but, but also internationally. Um, so you know, it's a challenge thinking about how we can you know, evaluate it and you know, hopefully improve it. Um, but it's been it's been quite fun and, and a pleasure to, to work with the SMART team as well. Thanks, Pete. We kind of like working with you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you maybe just talk us through some of the research that you've done so far, um, just in the last couple of years around SMART? Oh, sorry. Um, so I can I can speak to um, some of the more I guess some of the evidence more globally. I'll let Pete jump in and talk about some of the research that perhaps they've done. Um, so coming on board into smart recovery, we were interested in just getting a little bit more of an idea around um, how well smart performs. Like on the grounds, we know that it's a something that a number of people experience to be useful. Um, but when you look at the, I guess, the reviews that had been done and the evidence that had been summarised, we didn't have that at that stage. And so I was working as a um, researcher through University of Newcastle, through Amanda Baker, one of the um, research advisory committee members, and was fortunate enough to be asked to be involved in a systematic review of the evidence for smart recovery. Um, so that's where I come into things, been working with the team for a couple of years now. Um, and pulling together the evidence at that stage, I think we did it up until around April or so 2016. Um, we had 12 studies, both published and unpublished, about smart recovery. And at that stage, there was three of them which looked at the effectiveness of things. Um, and good news being we found positive and promising effects at that stage. So we've got some evidence around being able to uh, change alcohol use um, I think it was over a three month time frame. People um, increased the amount of time that they spent abstinence. They uh, decreased the number of drinks um, per drinking day um, and decreased the number of um, days that they were drinking as well. So that was pretty exciting. Um, we also had some really positive evidence from um, uh, comorbid settings um, and um, changes in what as well as. Everybody oh, there. sorry. Yep. <laughs> so people with experience of both um, uh, addictive behaviours and health-related concerns. Um, so there was a team in the US um, which worked in a sort of partial inpatient, outpatient setting, um, and they found some positive effects there for, for people being able to improve their um, alcohol use and also um, sort of more broadly, I guess, functional things around um, hospitalisation and quality of life, which is kind of neat. Um, and some of the other positive findings that we have is within a um, justice uh, setting. Um, so people who went through the correctional setting and completed smart recovery and uh, adaptation specifically for people within a justice setting, um, their risk of reoffending was massively less. Um, and when you combined the smart recovery with the justice related group, the effect was even bigger. Um, so we've got some really neat findings across a couple of different settings um, within smart recovery. And the research is growing. So courtesy of his team, um, range of people throughout um, sort of US and elsewhere that we've got uh, even bigger evidence based starting to come on board, which is exciting. Awesome, that's great. Um, Ali, some of your recent work's been around the ROM, the Routine Outcome Monitoring Improvement. Um, why is it important, do you think, to ask what you prefer to do? Yep, good question. Um, so, 
important on a number of different levels, both from um, a clinical kind of perspective as well as research. So from an on the ground, um, people using smart recovery kind of perspective, um, we know that when we pay attention to stuff, when we track our own behaviours, it can be really helpful for change. If you think of all of those kind of, I don't know, Fitbit or smart, uh, not smart, <laughs> um, Apple watches and those kind of things, they're on that principle of when we pay attention to a something, it can actually help us to change. Um, so being able to do that as part of a smart recovery group, hopefully it's a something that participants find to be useful to allow them to make the kind of changes that they want to see. <laughs> Um, and then from a research perspective, doing this kind of tracking over, over time, um, a lot of treatment and support services use it. It's kind of like a, a standard type thing. Um, but when it comes to peer support or mutual aid type groups, I guess the way that they're set up, it's not a something that's actually sort of standard practice. Um, and so it provides a useful opportunity for us to kind of do that and then be able to see how smart recovery is performing. Um, so we know that a lot of people find it incredibly useful. We know pockets of the literature, um, but this gives us like on the ground, day-to-day -day evidence about the sort of useful things that um, participants are seeing. Yeah, and it's just pretty cool to have the opportunity to ask participants. Very Yeah, nice. absolutely. <laughs> yep. And that's the thing that's kind of cool, being able to develop it from the ground up by working with um, participants, with facilitators, it gives us the opportunity to track stuff that's actually personally meaningful to people. Um, so I guess traditionally in the addiction world, we might just track substance use or um, whatever the addictive behaviour is. Um, whereas this now gives us an opportunity to expand beyond that and look at other things that might be important to people, you know, quality of life, mental health, self-care, whatever it may be. Yeah, well, quality of, of life is like, you know, extremely significant in you know, the work that we do. So having some measure of that is fantastic. Um, yeah. Why do we collect weekly data, Pete? You know, we've been doing that for a while now. What's that about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so Smart Recovery has been collecting weekly data from facilitators. Um, yeah, you can appreciate, so Smart Recovery, the, the head office is, is quite a sort of a small operating team and there's hundreds of, of groups now being delivered across Australia. And what I think is really an important research... You what, sorry? 180 now. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Okay, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of groups happening now. Um, for, from a research perspective, but also just from a practical sort of an understanding perspective of the smart recovery, it's, it's important to get a sense of where those groups are being held, how frequently they're being run, um, how many people are accessing those groups. Um, it's useful for smart recovery to, to get an understanding of what's, what's happening on the ground. Um, and I think it's it's important for us to um, you know, start thinking about you know, how how many people are engaging in these groups, how long that they're engaging for, what's the range of, of comorbidities people might be presenting um, to smart recovery as we're thinking about quality improvement, as we're thinking about you know, changes or modifying or upskilling staff. I, I think you need a, a level of information to be able to do that. And I think the, the project that Ali was just talking about, um, I think, links into that. So we're in the, in the process of, of trying to develop an app that will be um, hopefully ultimately available to, to all smart recovery um, facilitators and, and most importantly the, the people that are accessing the groups um, so we can start collecting some, some sort of real-time data from participants and hopefully do it in a way that's really useful for those guys as well so they'll get feedback and it's something that's meaningful to them um, and likewise it's, it's a way to, to evaluate and hopefully continue to improve smart recovery. What kinds of feedback might they get, Pete? Yeah, so so we're, we're currently in in the zone where we're meeting with um, app developers and we're we're, we're trying to, to to put it together. Um, I, I think the example that Ali gave is is probably the best one. So if, if anyone out there uses a, a Fitbit or a smartphone and you you collect any sort of exercise data, you'll you'll see sort of tables and charts and little graphs and th those types of things that come up in in the in, the, in those apps giving you some, some positive feedback about your progress. Um, likewise, for, for the Smart Recovery ROM or the Smart Recovery app that we're developing, we're hoping to give people feedback on you know, their substance use, obviously, but um, likewise their you know, well-being, mental, mental health, quality of, quality of life. So we've, um, we've gone through and, and tried to work out some, some questions um, based on some sort of recognised scales. 
um, but we're just about to engage with some qualitative researchers and we'll be um, talking and, and hopefully um, accessing a whole range of different smart recovery participants to you know, show them the questions that we're thinking about uh, asking, um, but likewise trying to show them some mock-ups of, of the app and you know, making sure that we are on the, the right track in the way that yeah, that information is presented back to, to participants. Um, what we'd really like is you know, participants to be using the app um, before they're going to a group each week and you know, it's something that's beneficial for them and gives them some feedback. But likewise, it might be something that they continue to use even if they're not um, regularly accessing the smart recovery groups. It's a, we're hoping that it's a helpful app in itself. Fantastic. So, um, Pete and Ali, this is a question for both of you. Um, from the research that you've done and the things that we're learning currently, what do you think are the active ingredients of smart? You know, what's a benefit to participants in showing? Yeah, I can jump in first if you want, Pete, and then. Yeah, sure jump in as well um, so one of the things um, with smart it's grounded in a couple of different principles that we know work incredibly well um, across the addiction field and across treatment more broadly so um, motivational interviewing and cognitive behavior therapy so just taking that back a notch um, motivational interviewing I guess is a way of being able to um, elicit your own motivation for change be able to kind of get that get up and go to be able to start to see the changes that you want to be able to see um, an opportunity to be able to sort of think through barriers and overcome those and take some steps that sort of feel doable um, to be able to get you where you need to go um, so being able to identify the steps be willing to take them and then see the um, I guess the build in the the confidence and the achievement that comes from doing that, definitely a, an important element when it comes to smart recovery. Um, I guess if everyone thinks about how they feel after they've achieved a goal, that yay can then be ongoing um, in terms of change. So that's definitely an important thing when it comes to smart recovery. Um, and the other one being the cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, so the relationship between thoughts and feelings and behaviours. So sometimes we talk to ourselves in helpful ways, which make it a bit more likely that we do something. Um, sometimes we talk to ourselves in ways that kind of defeat us and talk ourselves out of things and then we end up not doing something. Um, and so some of the um, tools and strategies that are run through Smart Recovery allow us to um, be better able to talk to ourselves more helpfully to make it more likely that we're able to take those steps that are important. Um, so there's some of the, the, the key kind of elements, I guess, from my perspective. Do you want me to, uh, can we talk to it? Yeah, yeah, look, yeah, I absolutely agree with everything that um, Ali was, was just saying. Um, I, I would just add, uh, never underestimate the sort of the importance of just that group process and the, the group cohesion. Um, so we've conducted a few studies now where we've um, looked at um, how much that people use sort of some of those CBT skills when they're out in the real world. And group cohesion is one of the significant predictors of whether or not people sort of take on board some of those cognitive and behavioural skills. Likewise, if we ask participants, like, what's the thing that you value most about smart recovery? It's, it's the group process, it's the group cohesion. So if, if there's any facilitators out, out there, I, yeah, I just wouldn't underestimate that, that aspect of it. Um, likewise, and probably pretty similar to what Ali was talking about, I think people like the practical tools that are, are part of smart recovery. And so, when we ask them, you know, what are the what are the tools or what are the skills that you particularly like? It's things like the cost benefit analysis and the the goal setting that tend to come up as like the, the things that they value the most. Um, likewise, when we survey um, facilitators, they're the things that that tend to to work the most. Interestingly, um, role play <laughs> comes out dead last. Um, if, um, if you look at the literature around CBT, nearly every single CBT manual, no matter what the disorder is, really recommends role plays as a way to upskill people and develop skills and get them to practice things in a safe environment and, and take it out into a real world. But I think that's something that doesn't, doesn't get practiced that much in, in smart recovery groups and it is maybe an area for, for future research or an area to improve. What about Pete just having a plan? What do we know about you know people doing better just simply by having a plan? Yeah, so um, if, if people are leaving smart recovery groups, and my understanding is that it's sort of a core part of leaving smart rec recovery groups is having that sort of seven day plan that you'd be working on be between groups. 
Um, and we know there's a bit of variability in terms of groups, so that happens sort of seamlessly every single group for, 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 some, for some locations and then is maybe a bit haphazard at other locations. Um, we know that um, participants who have a plan um, and leave each group with a plan are more likely to use some of the, the skills that are taught within Smart Recovery. So more likely to use some of those which is really practical behavioural skills that you'd be hoping people to use that you know, maybe avoiding high risk situations or, or whatever it is. So a plan seems like it's it's quite important in the context of smart recovery, at least you know when we're surveying participants. Look at the broader literature, goal setting and um, establishing plans are, are really quite powerful strategies to, to promote any kind of behavioural change. Um, so it's something that, that makes, makes sense. Um, I think, think something that we'd encourage would be getting people to start maybe writing down what their plans are or making a note of it in their phone or you know, actually working on, on their plan in between sessions is, is quite a, um, a key behavioural strategy as well. I noticed yeah, because being able to put something, sorry for interrupting, being able to put something in writing and or verbally saying it to someone else, it just makes it a little bit more likely that we're going to do it because it kind of ups the commitment. It's one thing thinking it to ourselves, but verbally expressing it to others or saying it in writing can kind of amp up the likelihood of change, I guess. In our meeting, lots of people like to write their plan on a whiteboard and then take a photo of it on their phone. And then nice. for the week, and it's kind of handy, I think, because it is a reminder to do the work. Um, yeah. Do we, um, Pete, what do we sort of know about that kind of homework that people do and its importance? So the things that people do between meetings that kind of consolidate the, the range of stuff that they've done in the meeting, but so that it's transferable into other aspects of their everyday life. Yeah. Uh, so, so my PhD was was on homework in a, in a totally different context with um, people living with um, quite severe um, mental illness, and um, all of the theory and all of the the research around homework is that it's it's quite an important ingredient. So people are much more likely to achieve their goals if um, they have regular homework. Um, the more specific their homework is, the um, the more you know sort of concrete whatever that plan is. Um, they're much more likely that they to actually do it and for it to, to, to lead to, to improvements. Um, we don't have a lot of data on what the specific homework tasks or the queen session activities or the, the seven day plans, um, there's a lot of ways you can describe it are for, for smart recovery, but we do know that the people that are um, kind of leading the groups with a specific plan um, are more likely to, to be using some of the CBT skills or report that they're more likely to, to be using those. Um, I think once we start using an app or something like that, we can get people to start recording some of their plans. I think we'll, we'll get some really rich and sort of vital information around you know, what other different strategies people use. Fantastic. That's great. Um, what are some research questions you think, Pete, that we haven't asked yet that we need to be asking? Yeah. Um, I, put, I think any of us could keep doing research for smart recovery you know, till we retire. I think there's lots of lots of questions just around you know, the population and who's attending the groups um, through to, to, to how the groups are, are being delivered. Um, I'll let Ali jump in, but I'll, I'll just add a, a few kind of kind of thoughts. Um, I, I think we're at the stage now where we need to start um, you know, doing some some larger randomised control trials and looking at who benefits from smart recovery and. A dozen and looking at outcomes. Um, I know that there's been some movement um, over in the United States for, for some of those types of studies, which I think are, are particularly interesting. Um, I'm really interested in what happens in the smart recovery groups. Um, so at the moment, we ask people, um, we do sort of national surveys and we get people to fill in sort of survey monkey things, but um, we haven't spent time you know, sitting in smart recovery groups and trying to capture some of the the unique processes of, of, of what goes on and really trying to identify how groups are, are delivered out in, out of the community. Uh, we've got a, a PhD student here, um, Liz Dale, who's going to start um, you know, trying to get her head around that, that area and start trying to look at you know the experience of people within the groups. Um, yeah, I think something else Liz is really interested in is thinking about sort of how culturally appropriate the groups are for Aboriginal people and so we're sort of in the process of, of trying to formulate some some research questions around that area as well. Did you want to jump in, Ali? Is that? Sure. Um, I guess one thing that I'd be interested in as well, and something that came from um, the review that we did, was the role of smart recovery with people with experience of mental health conditions, um, because we know that oftentimes an addictive behaviour can come hands in hands with problematic mental health, um, and so when we look at 
the literature so far, there's only one team that's explicitly addressed um, smart recovery for people with experience of both types of concerns. Um, so being able to see, because um, I guess the, the active ingredients, that kind of group process type stuff, the um, motivational interviewing, the CBT, all of these are sorts of things that can work incredibly well when it does come for mental health concerns. Um, so being able to see how best to do that within smart recovery is something that I'd be really interested in seeing for the future. That's a great point because there's a, there is a really large proportion of, of people accessing smart recovery groups who you know, present with you know, a range of comorbid mental health um, issues. Um, and so, yeah, really you know, try and think about you know, teasing that out, I think would be um, a good program of research. I should add, so we, we have a research advisory committee, which um, Andrew was introducing at the start. It would be great to get sort of research ideas or thoughts or whatnot from, from facilitators out there who are delivering the groups. I, I think the best way to improve any, um, you know, any, any program that's, that's being delivered is really you know, talking to the people who are delivering those, those groups and kind of as much as you can working in collaboration and doing sort of joint research projects. So, I think that would be a really nice thing to, to happen for, for smart recovery to maybe integrate a little more with some of the organizations or facilitators who are delivering these programs yeah i mean and just thinking about wellness in general like you know asking facilitators to give us questions around how we measure wellness um would be fantastic because i mean one of the things that really intrigues me about smart when people rock up is that they say first and foremost that it's just about that soft landing so there's no such thing as a stuff up there's only learning opportunities and I think that yeah. that is kind of a point of difference for us in the work that we do with people because it's really supporting wellness in its broadest sense. It's not mm. expecting people to be doing anything, but just to be doing the best that they can. Yeah. Mm. Um, where do you think SMART kind of fits on the continuum of care? Um, where in the participants' journey is it likely to be most useful? Do you think? <laughs> I can jump in but feel free to um, add or detract as the case may be. I guess from my understanding with smart recovery it's a, something that's really neat that it can fit a long way <laughs> along the journey. It doesn't necessarily have to be a particular point in care and or a particular point of where the person's at. Um, it's great. Um, I guess there's um, groups that are available that are being run through services as complementary to other types of addiction support and treatment. Um, and then we've got a range of lovely community-based groups as well to be able to access it in that kind of aftercare, I guess, to be able to support people to continue and maintain change, perhaps when sort of more formal service or treatment provision has finished. Um, but I guess that ability to be able to learn from one another and to be able to take steps towards either making and or maintaining change can fit um, wherever you're at. Yeah. I, I agree completely. I think that's, that's one of the strengths of smart recovery is that um, it, it can fit at any stage along the, the continuum. And I'm, I'm sure it, it does, depending on you know, what regions it's being delivered in and which services or, or who might be providing it. Um, I, I suspect there's groups that have people across that broad continuum and, and there's probably other groups that sort of specialise in you know, different aspects depending on the context that it's being delivered in. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, no, I mean, it just intrigues me that, you know, we live in a context where fewer than 30% of Australians have access to any kind of intervention. And of those, probably fewer than 10% get the intervention of their choice. So SMART has got to play a role in early intervention and also, you know, step down care as well um, in places where it's just simply not good. But also just in terms of that kind of general maintenance that people need to do in between those two spaces too. Yeah, absolutely. I can't remember the exact statistic off, off the top of my head, but Leanne Hyde presented at the NADA conference last week and was just talking about this sort of astronomical gap between when someone first identifies with having some sort of um, substance use problem and then when they actually access treatment and it would be yeah it'd be fantastic if if what well, any services but I think smart recovery can play an active role in, in trying to engage people at an earlier stage um, I suspect yeah. outcomes would be much more positive for those people yeah um so guys what are the implications um, of what we're learning from the research for our participants in our weekly groups do you think what can facilitators kind of use as the take home message from this research to do what they do better and to service, you know, to improve the quality of um, group facilitation and, and basically kind of give back to the fantastic participants that we work with every week? 
Do you want me to take a snap, <laughs> snap at that, Ali? Um, Sounds good. So yeah, as, as Ali was talking about, um, smart recovery has a really strong evidence base um, underneath it. And then the, the research that's starting to examine so smart recovery in itself has, has been really quite positive. Um, so I think one of the take home messages is that, you know, smart recovery is a, a really good treatment option for, for people living out in the, the community, which, which I think is, I think is great. Um, I think any, any intervention or program is only as good as kind of the people that are facilitating it um, and the, the level of group cohesion of, of people in, in the group. So I think as a facilitator, um, you know, making sure that you, you have an understanding of the, the program and keep brushing up on, on skills, I think is, is, particularly, is particularly important. Likewise, not focusing too much on skills in the meeting, like at the, um, at the neglect of, of the group process. Um, so I think what the job of facilitator is really helping to pull people together and get people sort of work, working towards a, a common direction. Um, so being upskilled and really understanding that the program, I think, is, is important. And we know that there's a bit of variability in the way that groups are, are delivered. And likewise, really thinking about the group process, I think, is um, yeah, particularly, particularly important. Um, all of the feedback that we get from participants is that they really like smart recovery groups. Um, and so I think I think that's a nice take home message as well. Yeah, yeah kind of keep up the good work. <laughs> Ali, do you have any ideas about how we might share the love? <laughs> <laughs> share the love? Well, my comment, yeah, was um, keep doing what we're doing. I guess the feedback that we're receiving is that people really enjoy the experience of um, smart recovery. Um, they like that balance of being able to learn from one another and also have a trained facilitator to be able to use some of those skills and strategies to kind of help with the process. Um, I guess being open if and when things do start to change, if we are starting to um, update manuals or skills training, et cetera, based on if we learn new stuff um, through the evidence. Um, but for now, keep up the good work. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, we've just got 10 minutes left, and I um, see that there's a bunch of um, questions coming through. Do you have access yep. to those questions too? Um, you're welcome to kind of just plow through and start yeah. asking things if you like, or I'll ask you some if that's better. Which would Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Sorry, when I was distracted before, um, Michael was um, showing a couple of questions that have come up. We've got one from for Peter, I think. Do you mean um, homework a participant takes on themselves. I haven't had much success setting homework and seeing it done. How would you encourage people to do something? <laughs> a really good question. It's a really great question. It's the eternal challenge. So it's um, anyone that works in any sort of counselling or group process, doctor, physio, any any sort of health related setting, getting people to do things in between sessions is is, is challenging. So I, when I use the term homework, I think I'm referring to, I think I'm wrong here, Angie, is it the seven day plan? Is that what it would be called in Smart Recovery? Yeah. Um, I, I think so in answer to, to Hugh's question, it's going to be a challenge and it's people aren't going to do it 100% of the time, but in ways to increase it, adherence is um, doing things like at the end of the meeting, making sure that you are doing that checkout and getting people to repeat back what their plan is. Um, the more specific they can be about that plan, the more likely it'll be that they'll they'll actually do it. Um, so as part of the meeting, you know, helping to, to workshop and trying to help people develop up a kind of a sensible plan that's meaningful for them, that targets whatever it is that, you know, they're motivated for or they care about at that, that point of time, and then trying to make it as, as specific as you can. Um, but it's, it's it's a challenge. And I, I think as a, as a group facilitator, don't give up, like keep, Keep keep doing it because I, I think people get the idea that it's it's important, but it's it's kind of easier said than done when you're the person that, that needs to get something done. Sorry, well, I just cut you off, Andrew. You gonna say something? I don't know. That's fine. Um, we've got another question about um, just the importance of verbalizing a plan or writing it down, um, and your comments on that. Um, the question is: it was participants like plans being noted on a whiteboard? Then taking a photo of it in my smart refresher course using whiteboards or even talking, taking notes was strongly discouraged why so i mean just a point of clarification i guess there um taking notes i suppose is difficult if people feel like stuff is being recorded about them without them but if you're writing on a whiteboard and encouraging participants to do that work for themselves then nothing's being written about somebody without their consent because they're doing the writing for themselves 
Um, so I suppose that's the point of difference. How do you guys feel about that? Is that something that you would encourage us to be doing as facilitators? Yeah, being able to write us something down, absolutely, definitely is something that's important. But I guess you've got to think, as you're saying, through the consent side of things, but also the group process side of things. So if you had someone who was kind of furiously taking notes throughout the entire group, that can kind of get a little bit tricky if other people aren't taking notes and you're trying to sort of facilitate that kind of group discussion. Um, but being able to have a sort of set time at the end of the group to be able to write down that plan, everyone knows that that's kind of what they're doing. Um, and or as you're saying, if it's a sort of shared whiteboard experience and people are aware that that's something that has been written down that people are okay about being able to take a photo of, um, I guess it's kind of the um, transparency and kind of mutual consent that people are okay with what's being done. Um, and at the end of the day, having a something that's personally meaningful to them written down and if for whatever reason it doesn't work during that week well then they can give it another bash the week after yeah. build from that week to week to week what would that kind of um recording um look like for people entering stuff into the app for themselves what what kind of things would they put into their plan and you know what would the plan look like yeah i think in terms of um the writing it down in the app we're keen for it to reflect whatever it is that matters to the participants so we're working with developers now but ideal world it would be great if people are able to write down whatever it is you know it might be look for five jobs this week or not go to the pub or you know whatever it might be um that sort of fits for them kind of um something that's going to take them in a direction of where they want to change so that's just for the sort of seven day action plan side of things so we'd like a free text what would you like to do here it is and we've got around um the facilitators being able to sort of workshop with people that sort of smart goal setting is something that's hopefully doable over the next seven days okay um are there any more questions out there guys they're feeding through slowly but i don't see any more on the screen at the moment Anybody else got anything that they would like to ask us? Um, well, I'd also like to just um, thank all the guys on the rack for their incredible work and to kind of flash the incredible um, <laughs> award that we won last week. This is like a research excellence award um, provided to us very generously by NADA, um, the network of Africa and other drugs, and we're incredibly grateful for this recognition. Um, but I'd just like to say cheers, Pete and the team, for your amazing work. For making all of this possible because you work you know really really hard um on a volunteer basis for us and we're so lucky to have you so thank you yes yeah, th thank you thank you as, as i said before it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure working with smart recovery i think what's really nice about that award is 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 smart recovery is really quite a, a small team and i think they've really embraced this idea of research and evaluation and have, have done a good job at, at pulling together um sort of like-minded you know, researchers and um, you know, people interested in evaluation um, into a sort of a cohesive team that supported that, that process. So, yeah, I think it's a real credit to, to Smart Recovery as well. What's an exciting team to be well, We're almost out of time. So thank you so much for your time today, guys. It was really lovely to chat with you. Um, I hope that we get to do this again in a couple of months because you'll have new research and we'll have new things to talk about. So I really, really look forward to that again soon. And thanks so much for your time. And thanks everybody for listening and joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Ange. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks.